Thank you for joining us today. Memory and the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice would like to welcome you to the fifth annual Tom Lantos Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial Archives commemoration at the US Capitol. Before we get started, um, I'd like to take care of a few procedural matters. If everyone could please turn off your cell phones or silence them so we don't have any disruptions during the meeting. Um, now, on the flip side of that, we have had some other technical issues, so we may have um, some audiovisual people entering during the uh, program, and so please uh, forgive us for any disruption that results from that. And Congressman Ryan is very busy with votes, so he's going to try to join us, but he may join us in the middle of someone else's remarks, in which case we're going to have to pause to recognize the Congressman. Then we'll continue with the rest of the program. Today, Memory will present and release its annual report on anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial in the Arab and Muslim world. This is a report that both exposes the purveyors of hatred and bigotry, but also recognizes champions of civility, equality, and justice. I'm Levi Tilleman, and my grandfather was Congressman Tom Lantos. Today, most of the work I do is in clean energy, but I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to join Memory pause and consider some of the challenges we face in this arena that is so important to the future of our world and was so deeply important to my grandfather. Before I introduce our long list of distinguished guests, I would like to thank the Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Boehner, who graciously sponsored our event. I will read a brief statement, um, an, expert, an excerpt from his greeting message uh, for all of you now. The Speaker says, fittingly, the Memory Project is named in Lantos' memory and continues to thrive, inspired by his legacy. In this spirit, we commemorate the critical work done by Anti-Semitism and Documentation Project as they continue to ensure that the past will never be forgotten, that the brutal injustices unleashed by the Nazis during the Holocaust will no longer be questioned nor ever repeated, and that today's world will face these injustices with a path towards truth and peace. When I got Yigal's email asking me to join him for this event, I seem to remember the last time we held this event, it was significantly warmer outside. Originally, this event was slated for July, but because of concerns regarding the sequester and impending government shutdown, it was postponed for six months. In some ways, today is the better date. <clears throat> Tonight, Republicans, Democrats, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and Jews will gather in this very building for one of our nation's most sacred displays of, if not national unity, national cohesion, the State of the Union. Regardless of our religious beliefs or ideological persuasions, Americans come together to affirm the unity of our great democracy. On this day, it's inspiring to see the overwhelming bipartisan support for the issues memory is dedicated to. My grandfather, Tom Lantos, would certainly approve. His family is eternally grateful for the support of his friends and colleagues on both sides of the aisle in promoting human rights across the globe, whether it be in Sudan, Cambodia, or his birthplace, Europe. At the same time, Tom would certainly be troubled by the resurgence of anti-Semitism in many European nations nations that the U.S. counts as friends and allies. Yigal will speak in a few moments about some of the truly disturbing displays in France from just this past weekend. Perhaps nothing is more distressing than the flippant displays of chauvinism by modern youth. This summer, I was in France for a wedding. In Bordeaux, I met a young Jewish piano teacher, and we ended up having a long conversation about our heritage and what it meant to each of us. Afterward, she confided to me that it was a great relief to be able to speak about is these issues so freely. In France, she almost always sought to hide her Jewish identity. In France, she said, Jews are almost always under attack. Across France, this sad truth is prominently under display. Today, legions of French youth photograph themselves performing a modern-day anti-Semitic fascist salute that mimics the Nazi armband. Each of today's speakers is a general in the battle against this kind of intolerance. Each has seen how lies, hatred, and bigotry form a toxin that corrupts entire nations and often lingers for generations. We must stand with them at the threshold of history and proclaim never again. 
And with that, um, I'm going to hand the floor over to my aunt Katrina Lantos Sweat. Um, Katrina serves as the vice chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. She's also the president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice and has taught human rights at the US Forum and US foreign policy at Tufts University and the University of Southern Denmark. Earlier in, in her career, Katrina worked under Joe Biden as deputy counsel to the Criminal Justice Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Katrina currently serves on boards of numerous organizations, including the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, the International Advisory Board of UN Watch, the Board of Hungary's Tom Lantos Institute, the Hungarian Initiatives Foundation, and the Advisory Board of the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. Katrina graduated from Yale with a degree in political science. She received a JD from the University of California, Hastings College of Law, and a PhD in history at the University of Southern Denmark. Thank you, Katrina. You know, I'm almost as proud of Levi as I would be of one of my own children. So one of the, the special benefits for me of being here today is to see this brilliant young man who I've known his entire life. And um, not only am I proud in the way that an aunt is proud of a talented and accomplished family member, but I'm also proud to see a legacy being carried down. Um, I know how much his grandfather, my late father, loved him and how often they would talk about what it meant um, to carry the burden of history, to be the grandson of Holocaust survivors. And so it really is, is just a wonderful thing to see Levi and, and so many of our family members stepping up to meet this challenge. I want to say at the outset that um, it's always a very special day for me when I am with my dear friend, Yigal Carmon, who is the passionate founder and leader and moving force behind the extraordinary work of Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute. Memory is informing and educating and changing the world on a daily basis with their um, really um, unprecedented work, bridging the language gap, making the world aware of some of the extraordinarily disturbing and outrageous evidences of anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and other forms of racism, bigotry, and prejudice around the world. And often, people are unaware of the work they're doing. It is eagerly snatched up by those in positions of influence, whether in the media, in politics, in academia. And this is one time in the year when we can gather to, to acknowledge really the source of so much of this invaluable research and, and information. Um, I also have a very special place in my heart for memory and for Yigal because shortly after my father passed away and we were just beginning as a new human rights foundation to build partnerships and friendships with other like-minded groups and organizations and beginning to see our path forward, Yigal came to us and said, you know, we want to partner with the Lantos Foundation. We want the work that we do to be associated with the extraordinary work of Tom Lantos and with his memory and his legacy. And so I sort of feel like, um, like our marriage was the first in, in a few liaisons that the, uh, that the Lantos Foundation has had. But this is the most enduring and the most important in so many ways of the of the many partnerships we have formed over the years. And I cannot tell you how proud I am, how proud I am so often to say, we are partners with memory. And I must tell you, Yigal, you don't even know this, but I rushed over to this event from um, an opportunity to speak at the Heritage Foundation. Always an interesting experience for me because as you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat, the daughter of a Democratic Congressman, and the Heritage Foundation is known as sort of favoring, if you will, the other side of the aisle. And so I always feel like I'm a, a little bit, you know, um, going undercover when I speak at the Heritage Foundation. But it was a very interesting um, discussion of the upcoming Sochi Olympics. And uh, my fellow speaker was Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. 
Um, as I say, you know, I'm a Democrat. He's certainly a prominent and admired Republican. And uh, as is often the case when you deal with issues of human rights and fundamental justice, the bridges are built because these issues transcend and go far beyond any of the partisan differences we have. Um, but as we were sort of shaking one another's hands at the end of uh, this event, and I said, you know, we'd invite you to join us if you have time and, and mention the name Memory. And his eyes lit up and he said, well, of course, everybody knows Memory. Everybody has such respect for this organization. It is doing work that no other organization is doing. And so, Yigal, once again, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be part of this work with you and to and to be in partnership with the tremendous work that you do. In the few minutes I have, I'd like to share a couple of episodes and anecdotes. About a year ago, a little over a year ago, I um, was part of a delegation of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, which traveled to Egypt as part of our work monitoring the status of religious freedom globally. One of the many meetings we had there, and they covered an enormous range, religious community leaders, NGO um, organizations, democracy activists, women's activists, you name it, we met with them to discuss the state of, of politics and human rights and religious freedom in Egypt at that time. And this was, of course, still under the Morsi presidency. And one of our meetings was with a deputy prime minister who was reputed to be one of the closest advisors to President Morsi, a Salafist. And this was not too distant from the time when, thanks to the work of memory, um, a, a, a recording had been made public of President Morsi speaking to a group of Egyptians and saying the following, we must raise our children and our grandchildren on the hatred of the Jews to the last generation. Well, we were sitting as close as you and I are in this meeting, perhaps a little closer. And it was an interesting situation because the deputy prime minister had indicated he didn't speak English, and so our conversation was taking place through translation. But our encounter with one another was to prove to me quite rapidly that he actually spoke and understood English. And you'll understand why when I explain what happened. So we sat close to one another and kind of went through our respective talking points. Very often when you're going in an official capacity, there's a certain formality to these encounters. But as I sat there, I could feel the spirit of my late father right here on my shoulder. And he was saying, you speak up. You put down those talking points. And you say something about this outrage. And so I looked at the deputy prime minister and I said, uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, not long ago it came to light that in the recent past your president said to a gathering of Egyptians that we must raise our children and grandchildren on hatred of the Jews to the last generation. Suddenly got very quiet in the room. I paused for a moment and then said, I am the daughter, the Jewish daughter, of Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. That was my first clue he understood English because the look on his face changed rather dramatically before the translation. And I said, what your president is saying is that the children of Egypt must be raised on hatred of me and of my seven children for shame. I said, this is a stain on the honor of a great nation and a great civilization. This calls down the greatest dishonor upon you and your people that could ever be imagined. Very quiet in the room. And then I pivoted and I said, I'd like you to engage in a little thought experiment with me. Let's imagine what would happen if next Friday, at Friday prayers, when your president speaks to a large gathering of Egyptians in a public square here in Cairo, an honorable and ancient city, if he were to stand up and say, my fellow Egyptians, no more, no more. I 
And too many of us here in this country have, over the centuries, nurtured and watered and grown a despicable hatred for our cousins, the Jews, for no other reason than their Jewishness. And this is unworthy of us. We have many, many disagreements with Israel, and we will continue to. And in the realm of politics and foreign affairs and defense policy, we can argue and we can disagree and we can fight for what we think is right for our nation. But we will no more engage in this despicable demonstration of racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and hatred. I said, well, I can tell you what I think would happen, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. I believe that your president would earn a place in history. He would earn the deserved plaudits and commendation from leaders and people across the world because he would have done something brave. He would have begun to turn a corner in history and to say to hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world, no more. Why should we stain our character with this irrational and unacceptable hatred? Well, we looked at one another and after a moment, he said something to the effect of, we hate Israel and Israel is bad. And the moment passed and we moved on. The very next day, I was in a meeting with a group of women rights activists in Egypt. And I recounted briefly this encounter to them. And the head of this woman, a very beautiful, very distinguished woman, a few years older than I am, who had been active in human rights causes in Egypt for a long time, nodded and she said, Oh, you are absolutely right. The day after President Morsi would say such a thing, tremendous praise and admiration would come in from every corner of the world. But the day after, the day after, he would be killed by his own people. I don't know whether she was right or wrong, but I knew then something that we all know here in this room, and that is that there is a big, big problem. And the only way we can push back against this evil, this inexplicable and seemingly unquenchable evil, is with unfailing vigilance. Vigilance, vigilance. And that is, of course, the work of the Lantos Archives. I want to close my remarks today by sharing another recent episode, if I may, because I think it shows that while memory is focused on the Middle East, its mandate is broader than that, and the problem is broader than that. Just a few days ago, the Lantos Foundation, in cooperation with the Hungary Initiatives Foundation and the Hungarian American Coalition and the Hungarian government and the Karl Lutz Foundation, opened a magnificent new exhibit at the United Nations to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Hungarian Holocaust, the particular tragedy that touched my own family so closely. Many, many family members on both sides lost their lives in that Holocaust, and my dear mother and my dear late father survived only thanks to the heroism and courage of Raoul Wallenberg, one of the great, great humanitarians of our time. And we were gathered to remember, but as I said to the people who were there for the opening of this exhibit, that an exhibit such as this is not really like going to an exhibit to, my, to admire a Matisse at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. An exhibit such as that is intended to teach, to remember, to educate, but also to arm us here and now in the present for the very real challenges we face today. And sadly, those challenges, as Levi suggested, include a disturbing resurgence of anti-Semitism in Hungary, in my parents' home country, in Europe, in the very place where six million were slaughtered, in the lifetimes of some of us in this room today. And very sadly, just in the last few days in Hungary, there was 
another example of these disturbing trends. The head of a historical institute established by the government made a comment in reference to a tragic 1941 deportation of nearly 20,000 Hungarian Jews to Ukraine. Those 20,000 Hungarian Jews deported to Ukraine were massacred in one of the first mass atrocities of the Hungarian Holocaust. And this happened in 1941, three years before Hungary fell under German occupation. And I took the occasion of that opening to call on the Hungarian government to repudiate the statement of the head of this foundation who had made the following comment, that the deportation was simply a local police action against illegal aliens. Well, we can never permit history to be whitewashed, to be revised, to be desecrated in this way. And as I said, vigilance, vigilance, vigilance must be our watchword. You know, when we were at this opening of this exhibit at the United Nations, right across the street is a memorial to Raoul Wallenberg. Five columns with a, an orb on the top, but the most compelling part of this memorial to Raoul is his suitcase, his briefcase. They bronzed it with his initials on it and it stands there on the sidewalk, alone. A symbol, of course, of his unfinished business because Raoul Wallenberg was taken, kidnapped, and disappeared into the Soviet gulag. And there it sits. But to me, it is not only a reminder of his unfinished business. It is a reminder of our unfinished business. And as I look out on each of you here today, here because we're fellow travelers, we same, share the same passion and conviction and belief, I know that Raoul Wallenberg's suitcase is waiting there for me, and it's waiting there for you. It is waiting for each of us to pick it up and to carry on his work. My late father used to say that the veneer of civilization is paper thin, we are its guardians, and we can never rest. Speaking for myself, Levi, my mother and the Lantos Foundation, speaking for my dear friend Yigal Carmon, you have our pledge that we will never rest. And today we ask for the same pledge from you. Thank you.